I'm so happy to be here talking to independent agencies. I'm a management consultant, I'll talk about that in a minute, and most of my clients over the last 25 years have been holding company agencies and their clients. And the subject of the book that I wrote, Madison Avenue Manslaughter, is about the predictable decline of the holding company agencies and the holding companies uh, that, that they support. And it's actually, if you understand how the holding company works, how it grows, how it generates income, uh, the events of this past year are not surprising at all. In fact, that is the story that I want to tell. It's a story about how value has been extracted from holding company agencies to support the share price of the holding companies and how they have been depleted of capability, which provides such a fascinating competitive opportunity for independent agencies. I really do believe that. I think that clients are prepared to experiment now in their relationships. Once the AOR disappeared, they're out looking for best in class, and this provides a great opportunity. So this isn't so much as what's wrong with the business, the business that you participate in. It's more what's wrong with the business of your competitors and what can be done about it in order to extract value. Uh, all right, I'm a management consultant, and they're not the most favored people in the agency world because usually they're benchmarking or you know, looking at salaries, overhead, profit margin. That isn't what I do. Uh, I worked at Boston Consulting at Bain for many years before I started my own firm here in London 25 years ago. And uh, I got a call from an agency who uh, was not making any money. And uh, I ended up, for, for analytical reasons, uh, documenting and measuring scopes of work. Because in order to understand an agency operations, I had to say, well, if you're like a factory, how much stuff do you do? What do you do? What do you make for which you're paid and for which you need resources? It's sort of a, an analytical way of getting at their economics. Uh, in the 25 years, I've counted that my team and myself have done 977 scopes of work. And that has been over a period of time, we've watched them evolve. And we've kind of kept track of what that has meant for agency economics. And it's a, it's a very big part of the story of the decline of the holding company agencies. This is a weird specialty because clients don't document scopes of work, as many of you know, in any uniform way. Agencies don't measure and document scopes of work. Holding companies don't. But fees and resources are agreed to. So it's kind of a, you know, it is the classic all-you-can-eat buffet. Uh, people are fixing prices and they're saying, you know, we'll do whatever, whatever is needed. Uh, and that's been a very bad strategy in recent years. No one in the world measures scopes of work, including ad agencies and their clients. And this this underscores uh, what some of the weaknesses are in the industry. Uh, many of you, even though I know this is not a baseball culture and the States is, but many of you may have read Moneyball by Michael Lewis, uh, which was a Brad Pitt, uh, Brad Pitt movie in, in 2011. And one of the things that Lewis is focused on was the unscientific way that baseball teams were run and how they spent their money on what kinds of ball players. And he said that it was, com Lewis concluded it was completely unscientific, and there were more scientific ways of analyzing the data uh, about teams and what it, really, uh, what it really took to win games. And Lewis concluded baseball executives' preference for opinions over hard data is due in least uh, due to a lifetime of experience with fishy data. If you have fishy data, and that's all you have, and you don't classify it as fishy, you tend to think it's the best data that you've got, and that's how you run things. That doesn't uh, help you if there are actually better data to understand operations. This is the agency world, I think, and whether it's independent or whether it is uh, holding company agencies. I think there is an enormous amount of fishy data. 
about what works, what clients want, what the economics of operations are. And the fact that the amount of work that people do isn't measured in any way and has very little to do with fees is the biggest indicator that there's fishy data because there's no data about workload. So um, what agencies say when they pitch is also a problem. Now I get to look at a lot of pitch documents even though I'm not a, you know, a search consultant or anything like that. Often agencies want me to help them price out new clients. And so they say, would you look at this, you know, what we're putting together. And I've sort of summarized it. I'm sure this isn't true for any of you, but <laughs> it's true for the holding companies. They say, A, we have a lot of capabilities. We're very creative across media. Uh, here's a list of everything we're good at and everything we know. Oh, by the way, the RFPs often ask for this sort of a format, so it's partly the client's fault. We've worked with a lot of clients. Uh, here are some relevant case histories. Our capabilities are the right ones for whatever you need because the clients never ask for what they need. Why do they change agencies? Some people think it's pricing and some think it's chemistry, et cetera. But the truth of the matter is clients are in trouble today. They really are in trouble. They're not growing. CMOs get sacked every three to four years half or double the rate of their CEOs. No one quite knows what to spend. And they issue RFPs to say, what year were you formed? How many people do you have? How many times have you worked in the industry? They're really asking the wrong questions and agencies are giving the wrong answers. So here's the team that we will field. Uh, they're pretty impressive people. And uh, we'd really like to work with you. That's sort of, you know, let's, let's boost ourselves. Um, and then if you look at the agency websites, which to me is a great indicator, agencies talk about their purpose or their mission. This happens to be from Saatchi, and I'm picking on them because Kevin Roberts wrote the foreword to my book, and he and I used to argue a lot about the purpose of an agency. In his case, and he wrote this, the dream is to be revered as the hothouse for world-changing creative ideas that transform our client businesses. The agency wants to be known for its ideas. But if you look at the greatest imaginable challenge for Saatchi, it's to transform the top 20 offices from good to great. Mm, that's not a great vote of confidence in themselves. Agencies think about their clients. We're happy to have you as a client. We're terrified we might lose you particularly at the holding company agency because revenue is God. We'll do whatever you want. Just give us a scope. Oh, by the way, we're waiting for the scope from the client. We're not generating it ourselves. Just give us a scope and we'll get to work. We'll give you the staff that you pay for. And don't forget, we're creative. We've won awards and we can handle it. It's sort of a servant mentality. And the clients over time, in my experience, have increasingly seen their agencies as vendors. They've gone from the partnership that used to exist during the commission days, during the creative revolution days, when agencies were in the driver's seat in encouraging their clients to spend on media uh, and generated the scopes of work, the new briefs that needed to be done. That has evolved to a situation where clients now determine the scopes of work and dribble them out in an informal way and they tell the agencies what they're gonna pay them and it has very little to do with the work. This is not the case, by the way, for the big uh, consulting firms. And the big consulting firms say, we help, this is a censure, we help shape our clients' future we help our clients find future value in growth in a digital market. And anyone who looks at the growth of any of the big advertisers know that they're in trouble. They've been in trouble since 2008. They're not growing. And the reason that they're not growing allows procurement to be as strong as, as they are because procurement can always add value by cutting costs. 
So the less a, a, an advertiser grows top line and grows its products, the more procurement is unleashed to do damage across the organization. And uh, procurement is not strong when marketing is and when uh, top line revenue is strong. But the consulting firms, and I know, I mean, I was a director at Bain for many years uh, in Europe and uh, sold business, and the leitmotif for everything we did was, you can be better, your, your current performance understates your full potential, we can help you figure out what your full potential is, here's our program of work to get there. And uh, Accenture pretty much says the same thing, the difference is they own media and creative operations. Deloitte says, we help leaders resolve their most critical decisions, drive value, and achieve transformational success. And they bought Monitor, which is a Bain-like consulting firm, to help them do the diagnostic that they need of uh, product line growth uh, and strategies. Bain and Company, uh, my old employer said, they're the best consulting partner for companies that are committed to quickly achieving and sustaining full potential. Uh, our clients realize on average yields of 26 times, 25 times return on fees and margin improvement of seven percentage points in two to three years. Uh, a, a, a real sales message to CEOs that are worried about growth. But if we go back to the Saatchi example, and it'd be the same at Ogilvy, JWT, Weiner, BBDO, TBWA, McCann, FCB, all of them focus on what they are good at, what their capabilities are, and there's much less dialogue about how what we do helps you deal with your performance problems. That's a problem. Clients, for their part, are saying, whether they share it or not, we are not achieving our budgeted targets. And they say to their agencies, here's your fee, less than last year. Fees have been cut, uh, by my calculations, at a rate of about 3% compounded per year for the last 25 years. That's absolute fees have come down if you take out inflation by 2 to 3%. Uh, much more aggressively if, if you look at what happens when agencies change. But if you're, if you're graphing, if you can, to get the data to graph what's happened to fees, my calculations say that fees have been dropping at 2 to 3% per year. Uh, that's pretty big. And clients also say we're transitioning from whatever we were doing before to more digital and more social stuff. And all the ad agencies over the last five to 10 years have been saying, we can do that, we've got the capability, we're transitioning as well. Um, we're relying on you to get the work out the door on time. If we're happy with your work, we'll keep you, otherwise we'll do a review. And you know what the pace of reviews has been. It has been very rapid. Every time there's a review, there's a cut in fee and an investment by an agency, A, to get the work, and B, to really show their stuff the first year. And then it becomes difficult to, to make any money. Here is, from my uh, analysis, a uh, 1992 to 2017, the scopes of work uh, for a 50 creative office, 50 heads in the creative department. In 1992, a 50 creative office would do 385 briefs, which is about just under eight briefs per creative, one and a half, uh, you know, about, uh, 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 they'd have about a month and a half to do each one. Uh, today it's in the 15,000 category. And I'm not talking about one agency, I see this all the time. Those are Facebook posts, those are ad banners, that's email marketing. That's one deliverable per creative per day with very little really defensible strategic content. Agencies have moved as a result of globalization and the loss of AR status and through digital and social. They have moved from being 
premium French restaurants to burger flippers. It's a fast food operation today. Agencies are doing fast food stuff. And it is very easy for clients to take this work away. Um, one of my clients said, uh, one of our clients it wants to cut our fees by 80% per year because they say our people are too expensive. <clears throat> so I asked them, you know, what was the average salary of the people on the client account? It was $100,000. That's less than a consulting firm would hire a first year person if you add in all the bonuses. So it's a $100,000 person, which is not a lot of money. But then you add 100,000 for overhead and 22,000 for a 10% margin. And it costs the client $222,000 for one of those burger flippers. And uh, the client is thinking, I can get that work done by someone I hire for 60 to 80. They forget about overhead and all the other benefits that go with it. So the terrible thing about this is this is responsive to where clients are going, but it has meant an abandonment of strategic work. And it has put the massive vol volume of work in an area where it can be taken away by clients because it's not hard to do this stuff. So it's a strategic shift. It's a shift from partnership to vendor. And it's also done at too low a price. And in fact, as I measure scopes of work and the prices that go with the scope of work, agencies are not even being paid fairly for this. And it's killing people. So, it's a, it's a pretty serious thing. And it is affecting the holding companies. We all know, uh, as, as we just saw, the WPP shares are down 30 to 35%. But let's think about how they got into this situation. Uh, they bought, uh, he bought JWT and Ogilvy back in the 80s. It was the commission days. Those agencies were earning a ton of money and not doing a lot of work. And they could have shown 60% margins in those days, but they didn't because they staffed up until their profits showed about 10%. So agencies in those days had about double the number of people they actually needed to do the work. And they had great parties, and they paid bonuses. And, and Sorrell knew, being a finance director at Saatchi, that if he bought overstaffed agencies that he could drive their costs down and inflate his own profits and growth as a result, and it would drive up WPP shares. So the, the game of a holding company is buy overstaffed organizations, squeeze them to get the profits up, and do that every year by being an extremely aggressive uh, budgeter. And that's how agencies were really managed by WPP, aggressive budgets. Give me more growth, give me more profitability, and agencies responded for the most part by doing that and downsizing. And they've been, Ogilvy and JWT have been downsizing for over 30 years. You know that game gets played out at some point. It's totally predictable, because we're not dealing with machine tools here, we're talking about people. And on top of it, as a result of all the shifts in uh, media types, scopes of work have grown. Scopes of work have grown at uh, compounded at, at three to four percent per year. Sounds like a small number, but if you take declining fees and growing scopes of work and downsizing, you've got a recipe for disaster. So, terrible year, and then Martin talked to the press and to his board about his plan B hard to get growth. He said, our focus will be even greater cost efficiency, and we will break down silos consolidating our creative ad buying strategy and public relations firms. And then he started putting the companies together. Honestly, that's just another cost saving thing to get rid of overhead and get rid of senior people. It did not deal with growing scopes of work or price. And I'm going to argue that this was a, this was a non Plan B, because he also said the most successful agency groups are those who offer simplicity and flexibility of structure. Where's the client in this? If clients are looking for efficiency because they're not growing, well, they'll find efficiency here. But the agencies that support it have been liquidated. 
They've liquidated their capabilities. Finance director of JWT in New York told me, he said, I came in six years ago, we were on five floors, now we're on two. There has been a major downsizing and the senior talent is gone. I'd argue Sir Martin didn't have a plan B and that this was not convincing for the board. And we know a lot of other things have gone on and we know that he's resigned. But I think that the people that are running it now and whomever they bring in as a CEO has got a, a very big job ahead to try to get uh, the company growing again. This is my construction of the price for agency services since I've been in business. So let me explain. I measure scopes of work. I you know, count up the deliverables. I turn them into homogeneous units, called a scope metric unit, because you know, an ad banner and a TV commercial are different sizes. So you need a, a uniform thing. This is the price per normalized output. It's like price per TV equivalent outputs since 1992, and inflation's taken out. So my first client, Ogilvy UK, 1992, they're the ones that had 385 deliverables uh, and a certain level of income, and they were getting $435,000 per TV equivalent, okay? They only did TV radio print. My clients today get somewhere between 125,000 and 139,000. The price curve for agency services is driven downwards because workloads are going up and fees are coming down. And all we're doing is dividing one by the other. This is a price curve that looks like laptops or looks like hard goods where manufacturers have completely changed their technology. But agencies haven't completely changed their technology. They've got creative, client service, strategic planning, and production people. And the process of developing an a, a strategy and then doing creative development and production hasn't changed all that much. There's been a lot of change in the studio, of course. But overall, it's a labor-intensive business. So uh, when you have a price curve like this in a labor-intensive business, the only way you can deliver profits is to downsize. The only way you can deliver profits is if you downsize, and if you downsize, you are starting to liquidate your capability. And I think that's what's happened. We have growing workloads, declining fees, declining price, agencies downsizings, and it has changed the power balance between advertisers and their agencies, because I think agencies in general are less capable of uh, doing what clients actually need, which is to get growth and profitability. Ag agency resources for equal size scopes of work are very, very different today. They're more junior, uh, and uh, they are cheaper, and there are fewer of them. They're starving. And uh, I also look at how much stuff that the creatives have to crank out, that's more than doubled over the time I've been in business. But that price curve is from my clients. So, you know, I measure that all the time. Here's the gap in agency logic that has led to all the difficulties. Um, I think there are three things you need to know if you, wanna, if you wanna study the health of an agency office or a, a sum of the offices. You need to know what they do and how much stuff they do. You need to know what they get for that and then what the resources and costs are. If you know income and resources and cost, you have the metric that agencies have today, which is profitability. You know, they know their overall profitability at the end of the year. Sometimes they know it by client. But what they don't know is price that they're getting from their client. And that's simply income divided by workload. Like, you know, five million in income and a certain number of TV equivalents of work across the entire scope of work. The other thing they don't know is how much stuff their people are having to do per head. Now, any other business in the world, including consulting, which is a service business, knows 
how much stuff are my people having to do and how much am I actually getting for the stuff that I do? This is the only industry I've ever studied in you know, over 40 years of consulting that doesn't have a price. The ANA, the AM, uh, the uh, ANA and the four A's and all the other industry associations in this industry do not track price because no one knows workloads. And yet every other trade association in every other industry in the world tracks price as a religion. Every, every trade association wants to know what's happening to price for their members and what they can do about it. Here I've shown you that price is coming down. It's down by two thirds since I've been in business. Now, uh, income is known, resources and costs are known, profitability is known, but workload is not known, price is not known, and productivity is not known. So agencies have allowed themselves to be in a situation where clients can tell them what the fee is, and then through a completely separate process, the workloads emerge from emails, from PowerPoint presentations, from telephone calls, texts, or what have you. Work is not planned today at the beginning of a fiscal year. Uh, it's not even really planned on a quarterly basis, except when media has been bought in advance. This is a huge failing on the part of management. And I'd argue it's a, it's a huge failing by clients, too, because if they have brand growth problems, isn't the scope of work and the media spend kind of the answer? Does anyone say this is the scope of work that will solve the problem? Is it coming from the agency? No. Is it coming from the marketing staff? Probably not. It's sort of like, uh, do we want to do more digital this year than last? Or do you think we'll do more social? Maybe we'll do more social. That's a good thing to do. But you don't say, this is the scope that's going to solve our problem. So the lack of scope of work planning and documentation and measuring goes beyond price. It also goes to the quality of the relationship. The game of advertising today, I think, has now has moved into the area of sloppy work, you know, done cheap by very junior people who are exceptionally overworked and are not really working on the problems that clients need. And clients are failing because they're not asking for that kind of help, at least not from their agencies. So a better relationship, and, and the, I'm going to imagine that I'm the head of an agency talking to an existing client, is we are underperforming in the marketplace. Our, our brands are not growing. We're not deliver, we have not cracked millennials. We haven't cracked e-commerce. We haven't really cracked the trade. Uh, consumers are buying differently. And our legacy brands with our legacy positioning and the legacy ways that we have of communicating uh, are, not really, uh, are not really giving us the growth. Let's figure out why we're not growing as a matter of strategic importance. And let's develop a strategy for fixing that. Let's develop a media plan and spend. And let's develop a creative scope of work that has the best chance of fixing our problem. Let's have an adult discussion about that. That's not the same thing as saying, we'll do whatever you want, at whatever fee you're willing to pay. It's really, you know, it's a pushback. It's saying, let's figure out what we need to do to get performance, and let's calculate what it will cost to do the scope of work that will fix this problem. If you can't afford that, we'll cut back on the scope. We price by deliverable. Now, every agency client I've ever had had a horror of this. They said, well, then we're just a job shop. Uh, we're really not in the business of doing deliverables. We're in the big ideas business, or we're in the uh, brand equity business. Well, actually, no, you're not. You are in the deliverables business. The deliverables are meant to build grand equity. And they're, they're meant to incorporate big ideas. But you are in the deliverables business. That's why you need people. And that's why you need the number of people. So pricing by deliverable, having a different price for a Facebook calendar from a TV ad, 
a TV origination or a TV adaptation. It makes enormous sense, and it can be done. It's off-the-shelf technology. Our fee will be based on the agreed scope of work, and once we get started, we will review progress every quarter and make necessary changes. I don't know a single agency holding company that does this. All right, so, you know, how do you measure scopes of work? It's a little bit like saying, how many calories are in a basket of fruit? You uh, you'd classify each fruit. We've got bananas, we've got apples and oranges. Uh, each type has a different caloric value by weight. <coughs> bananas are 90 calories per 100 grams, for example, and apples are about 15. And then, so you would know those. You'd look up the values. You would calculate the calories for each piece of fruit, and you'd add it up for the total basket. And that would be it. And that's exactly what you do with a scope of work. You have all these different deliverables that are different sizes. And um, we've got ad unit banners. We've got applications. We've got digital. Uh, we've got online videos all the way to TV originations. They're different sizes, and they can have different workload values to which you can apply the prices. When you, uh, you're not gonna be able to read this, but when you have for each client a scope of work and a measurement of how much work is in that scope of work, how many scope metric units, then you can, well I've taken an airline here, you can put in, it's 1800 hours for an FTE, here are the billing rates we use, Here's what the contract allows us in people. We get eight creatives, five client service, a half a planner, a half a production people for 14. But the model, a model based on scope of work says, uh, 14 is not enough, we need 26 people. At those billing rates, that's a 6.8 million fee, not the 3.9, which is what the client gave us and the scope that emerged. This particular airline, um, real client by the way, 2,000 deliverables, for, uh, 70 SMUs, scope metric units. And do you remember the price curve went from 435 to 139,000 on average? This agency is getting 55,000 per SMU because they're getting 3.9 million in fees and they're doing 70 SMUs. You divide one by the other, it's 55. That's a third of the market price and about a fifth of what's needed to staff something properly. And it's what happens when you accept an undefined scope of work with a service attitude saying, we'll do whatever you need and we'll be digital and social. And then the client says, well, you know, we can only afford four million this year and okay, we'll take it. Then, then you're doing the work for $55,000 per SMU when the market's 139 and the desired level is closer to 200. That's what you get. And uh, just, to, just to show you what that scope looks like, here are the 2,000 deliverables broken into uh, origination high creative complexity all the way back down to adaptations of low creative complexity. And of the 2,000 deliverables, 1,600 are adaptation, low creative complexity, print below the line. I mean, it, it, that's the hamburger flipping kind of stuff. So <coughs> here's an agency that takes an airline client, is doing 2,000 deliverables, most of them are adaptations, and it's being underpaid by a factor of three killing its people, and the client's getting no benefit, really. I mean, because this is not going to move the brand. This is not where a holding company agency wants to be. So I think as a first step to correcting the problems that I've talked about here, agencies need to have some policies. And, and one of them is for every client in every office, we will document and measure our uh, scopes of work uniformly. We will have a system for doing this. Uh, this is required whether or not the client has its own system. Scope of work workloads will be the primary basis by which we propose and negotiate fees. Client heads will be accountable for the balance among 
the work they agree to do, the fees and the resources. And client heads will develop action plans when they're in a situation like this airline where they're only being paid for a, by a third. Their performance will be reviewed by somebody, the office head or a CFO or somebody. Right now, client heads, no transparency in what they're doing, what they're agreeing to. There's no accountability. They don't report to office heads. They don't report to CFOs. They don't report to the chief executive. In fact, they're pretty much left to do whatever they want. Run the client. For new business, uh, I think for all new business situations where an agency intends to bid, there should be an understanding that the agency will be involved in planning scopes of work with the client, that much of a partnership. We don't just take what you give us. We have a point of view about what's needed to turn the brands around. And there must be detailed scopes of work in the pitch so that agencies can, uh, can, can pitch the amount of fee that they want. There must be a willingness to base remuneration on deliverables. At least they're open-minded about it. And there must be agreement to track and measure scopes of work uh, and, and its changes throughout the year. That would be the a minor pushback by agencies rather than saying, well, do whatever you want at whatever fee you're prepared to pay. But as I found out, uh, it, this is a hard thing to sell in, and it requires CEO leadership. It has to be the chief executive of an agency. It's easier to do in an independent agency where there are founders and people that are closer to the action. A commitment of the CEO to transform the culture from service uh, uh, and servant to partner, focus on performance, plan scopes of work, get paid by deliverable, create accountability within the culture. That is a very big transformation from, we'll do whatever you want, and each client head can sort of figure that out on his or her own, which is even where all the big holding companies are. The focus today needs to be on price realization, not on cost containment. This is not a cost business. This is, a, this is a, how do we get more money for what we're doing? Well, we get it by delivering results. Don't forget, the consulting firms are getting a five times multiple on the cost of their people. And their people cost twice as much as agency people. So they're getting you know, up to five to 10 times as much per hour. How do they do that to deliver results? Uh, so delivering results is where you get price realization. There needs to be increased accountability among the account leaders. Performance needs to be measured. Correct the misaligned clients. Track success. Yes, thank you. Uh, of corrections and make this the new modus operandi for the entire agency office. See, in a way, I think steal a, a little bit of the lessons from the consulting firms. They are first problem solvers, and then they implement their programs. And if you thought the right thing for you to do is solve the brand performance problem through good strategies, and then think of the media and the creative work as downstream work that you're doing. It's not the business you're in is creative and media. The business you're in is solving client brand problems and then doing what's necessary to make it work. And that's, I think, what the Accenture, Deloitte, PwC, IBM, and the others like McKinsey and Bain that are getting into this business now quietly are, are going to be all about. They're going to turn their consultants loose on the brand performance problem, and then they're going to maintain the relationship by doing media and creative work. What you need to do is, I think, strengthen <clears throat> the business analysis part of what you do and then deliver you know, the high-performing media and uh, creative scopes of work that make it possible. And uh, when you've done that, I think uh, you're going to be out of Madison Avenue manslaughter and you're going to be in a business where you can uh, take advantage of the weakness of the holding company agencies and start to own some, a piece of these big client relationships yourself. 
Okay, thank you very much.